Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this midday moment. No syrup today, no streams, but welcome to my study. This is the place where um, I get to prepare the food every week. And, um, you know, I was thinking about the numbers and, uh, you know, God is the one who gives us the food. I'm just, I've told you this before, I'm just the one who puts it on a serving tray. I'm the waiter that brings it to you. And uh, it seems to me I've prepared over a thousand meals in this very room. So welcome to my study. Uh, great to have you here with us this afternoon. If you were thinking Pastor KK was going to be here and you're disappointed, I apologize for that. We've traded spaces, traded places this week. And um, he'll be, uh, you, you can pick him up on Sunday morning. He'll be there. So so tune in on Sunday morning at 9 and 11. Um I'm also, I'm also going to uh, use this time uh, to give, uh, to outline the next series for our sermon, uh, our next sermon series for our summer. And uh, hey, guess what? You're going to get in on the reveal, uh, the big reveal right now. So our next series is going to be Hope for Hard Times, a study in the uh, letters of First and Second Peter. So uh, it kind of is Mark the sequel. So I hope you're going to enjoy that and get ready for that. And I'm just checking on seeing who's tuning in here. Um, say hello. It's good to see uh, people joining in and, uh, and good to have you with us today. Um, about 10 years ago or so, uh, John Piper uh, was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And um, he had written a book uh, prior to that. He's written over 50 books. He, he wrote a book uh, prior to that called Don't Waste Your Life. And at the time that he was diagnosed with cancer, he wrote a book, Don't Waste Your Cancer. Uh, I'm taking a, a, a page out of his, his uh, idea. And today I want to talk to you about Don't Waste the Pandemic. Now I've got a, a number of ideas here that I, I'm putting together. Um, I've been reading Piper, of course, and, and Paul Carter with the Covidian exile idea and, and Ross Hastings with some ideas here. Um, but primarily, uh, I hope I'm bringing you ideas from God and what we find in his word. So um, I just want to bring some thoughts on this Covidian exile today, and I hope they'll be helpful for you because right now we're all preoccupied with uh, disease, the disease disaster plan that's out there. And opinions, of course, abound on the right thing to do. Um, whatever you believe uh, now, critiquing the present global protocol is very polarizing. So I'm not, I don't think that's a good use of our teaching time and I'm not going to do that today. But this global disease disaster plan is virtually physical. It's physical distancing. And I've been wondering if this isn't a perfect metaphor for what God is seeking to teach us right now. The secular worldview action plan usually completely misses the spiritual point. And I wonder if the real issue behind this global pandemic is really a wake-up call from God about spiritual distancing. From God. If the human family goes through this moment and attempts to come out the other side with no changes other than some temporary protocol to physical distancing, the gravity of the moment will be a massive waste of life and livelihood. Have you stopped to consider what God might be saying in this distressing time to us? Is there any possibility that there is something bigger than a virus infestation and a world of death panic people going on? Is God involved here at all, and is it possible that he's seeking to get the attention of his creation, namely humans? I mean, as I look out my window, the birds and the tulips are doing fine. This isn't a green moment brought on by human pollution. This is a God moment. And God is allowing his good creation to not be good at global proportions so why are you willing to consider that god is graciously granting another opportunity for people to to know him you know in the word of god romans 121 although they knew god they neither glorified him as god nor gave thanks to him people are being given a second chance i believe to know him you see, the heavens, it says in the Bible, the heavens declare the glory of God. So humans are without excuse. But nevertheless, 
Here is God graciously grabbing distracted people's attention. If his goodness will not captivate their attention, he will withdraw his protective goodness and allow the fruit of fallenness to plague humanity. And because God is completely in charge of diseases and plagues, Matthew 4.23, at a national or a global scale, this has all the earmarks of God's judgment. I, I want to look in Psalm... Uh, the other day I was actually doing my um, devotions. I'm doing my devotions through the Psalms right now. And I was looking at... Uh, I, I'm at Psalm 106. And what jumped out at me were a couple of verses... And this uh, Psalm 106 is a, a psalm um, that, that outlines uh, God's provocation with his people and all their rebellion. And, and, a, and a few verses, listen to this. In the desert, I'm, I'm, uh, Psalm 106, verse 14. In the desert, they gave in to their craving. In the wasteland, they put God to the test. So he gave them what they asked for, but sent a wasting disease upon them, verse 15. And then a little further on in the psalm, verse 28, they yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices offered to lifeless gods, and they provoked the Lord's anger by their wicked deeds, and a plague broke out among them. That's verse 28 and 29. So you, you see here that, that in the past, God has, has demonstrated in his word that, that the sovereign God, in fact, does permit disaster but he permits it on purpose. So I, I think it's legitimate to say to, to us today, don't waste this pandemic. So what do we need to do? Does God have a disaster response protocol? That's the question we're asking. And I believe the answer is yes. There is a common message, whether you've forgotten God or you know G him, Jesus delivered this message when he was among us, and it's in Luke 13:5. Luke 13, verses 1 to 5. Now, in that text, there are two tragedies. Pilate has murdered some worshipers and mixed their blood with sacrificial animals. And a tower had fallen on some of the people at Siloam, which is a pool where people went to be healed. And then, of course, upon us right now is this great tragedy this weekend in Nova Scotia. And there seems to be a common human approach to, to tragedy that undermines any personal lessons if we're not careful. One, we're thankful that it didn't happen to us. Or two, we somehow think that maybe they deserved it. So let's go to the second. That's the one that Jesus addresses. Was th these, were these tragedies all about their sin? Uh, surely there's karma in this world. They, they probably were greatly sinning, people said. Is, is that how it is with this COVID disease? Are we thinking that, that people are dying or are being particularly uh, singled out for judgment? I want you to listen carefully to, to Jesus' disaster response that, we've, that we uh, can read in Luke chapter uh, 13, verses 1 to 5. This is Je Jesus' disaster response. Listen to this, this event. He, it, the only one recorded in all the Gospels is found in Luke, this particular incident. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Note that. I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will will all perish. Notice that? So there are some critical points that I want to want to make here from this text, and, and I just want to go through them. By the way, I'm, I'm going to post this whole thing, uh, so that because uh, I'm going pretty quickly through it, so that you can have a chance to digest it and reflect upon it yourselves. But no one is necessarily guiltier than another. There's no direct line between the person and the tragedy, from what I can see here. Mass, tragic, death doesn't discriminate. Secondly, God permits evil tragedies to expose man's mortality, to remind us that we die, that the inevitability of death might drive people to God. Now, God is not responsible for evil, we know that, but within his sovereign will, he sometimes withdraws his goodness and permits fallenness 
the fruit of rebellion to play out its natural recourse. Third, repentance is the imperative here for all of us. This is Jesus' disaster plan. A change of heart and mind about who Jesus is and, and to stop relying on ourselves for salvation. Luke makes much of repentance. It's Jesus' emphasis in his ministry. He himself was concerned about the so-called righteous who need not repent, confident in their self-righteous religiosity. And then fourthly, and this goes on from verse 6, there's a national responsibility to shield people from disaster. There's been hygiene failures and preparedness failures here and response failures and spiritual failures. But listen, beloved, nobody's singled out necessarily for specific judgment. But the tragedies are a stern warning to a reckless world ignoring God that unless they repent, this is their end too. Destruction. But I want to take in a bit of a journey as well to the, therefore, what God might be saying to the church. That's what he's saying to the world. And here's some of my ideas, some of my points that have come out of God's Word. One, He doesn't find our worship pleasing. Two, He's no longer willing to compete with our Sunday idols, and He's tired of our laissez-faire approach to regular corporate worship commitment. Three, He's concerned about our drift from total dependence on God, waking us up to our vulnerabilities. Money and science has massive limitations. Fourth, there is much sin in the church. Denials of Christ. Allowing the appalling morals and messaging of this world to become a common reality of our own pastimes and entertainment. The world, do you realize that the world hates Jesus or actively opposes our Jesus far more than we hate the sin they peddle? David Wells said this, Worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness look strange. Fifth, disunity and unforgiveness and mistreatment of one another. Six, we've ignored the needy and vulnerable. Seven, he feels robbed by the church or maybe he's displeased with the way we are investing his resources. Eight, the bankruptcy of individualism and promiscuity, the essential nature of the family. In isolation, you can still have community if you have a family. Physical distancing forces the sexually immoral to pick a family. Nine, this is for leadership, building our own brand under the guise of advancing Jesus' gospel. Arrogance and ambition and competition and humble bragging among church leaders, taking personal credit for building Christ's church. Number 10, tampering with his word. We're calling it progressive evangelicalism, which of course was just what we used to call a classic liberalism with a positive spin. Adjusting truth to fit our preferred worldview. Soft on creation and human sexuality truth. False teachings like a virus, you know, friend. It preys on the weak and the vulnerable. And like COVID-19, it may not show immediate symptoms while killing those in its range. So what to do now? Recommendation from God's Word in Luke. Jesus doubles down on it in Luke 13. Repent. Find quietness and rest, peace. Take a pause. You know, it would seem to me that, that our, our drivenness and our noise and our busyness and our dependence on ourselves has, has been called into a kind of a full halt by Christ, by the living God, wanting us to maybe take some time, pivot. You've heard that terminology being used. Pause. Think about the things that we're talking about today. Pivot. Discover some new spiritual rhythms. Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone. Ross Hastings brought this out nicely. Verse 1. We know our theology, don't we? In fact, we try to get pretty good at knowing our theology, but there's an imperative several verses down. So it says... May my soul find rest in God alone. But there's an imperative in verse 5. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. It's one thing to know our theology. It's quite another to do it. So can I encourage you at this moment what to do? Repent. Spend some time reflecting and considering your own life. Turn from the things that maybe are displeasing God and repent. Turn to Him. 
Turn from the, take some time from the, the drivenness, the noise, the busyness, the dependence on ourselves, this opportunity that God has given to us to really take stock of our lives and check things out. Pivot. Discover some new spiritual rhythms. I know we're telling each other to, that, that my soul finds rest in God alone, and that's the right thing. That's the right theology. But it's fa fabulously intriguing that the psalmist himself, five verses later, commanded himself, find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. Beloved, we know our stuff, but it's not going to do us any good unless we do it. Hey, it's been so great to be with you today. And uh, remember Sunday, uh, well actually remember tomorrow is uh, Worship Wednesday. Uh, midday moment. So it was great doing lunch with you today, and uh, thanks for letting me uh, come into your home and share some thoughts with you. Blessings to all. Love you so much. Goodbye.